Let's go on that. Minor topic. Yeah. Bringing a billion people into crypto. Um, why don't we first start out just by explaining Cello and kind of the unique approach that you've taken to mobile first, because uh, it, it is very different from most of the other projects that we've heard from over the last couple of days. Yeah, absolutely. And can you guys hear me? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah, so I think Cello um, is unique in that, um, number one, it really is focused on mobile um, and really focused on usability. Um, if you think about it, you know, there's, um, um, you know, if you think about how, how do we realistically get to the, this kind of next billion uh, set of users on crypto, that is a staggering number. I think MetaMask has something like 5 million uh, monthly active users right now. Uh, it's a really great product, and it's really gotten us to where we are now. But it's hard to imagine that that will get us to, to a billion users. And so uh, our belief, our bet, is really that mobile is the way to go. There's something like um, 2 billion PCs in the world right now. Um, uh, most of those, many of those are servers. Uh, meanwhile, there's 8 billion mobile devices in the world, uh, 6 billion of which are smartphones. Uh, it's very clear that, that uh, smartphones are the way to go. And so everything we've done in Celo is, is thinking about how, how can we create really amazing experiences for these 6 billion smartphones that have active mobile subscriptions in the world today. And, and so that means um, consensus, right? We need a consensus protocol that has a like client protocol that can actually realistically work on a mobile device. There's no uh, chain really out there other than Celo that you can realistically sync with the network in a fully peer-to-peer -peer manner, in a fully censorship-resistant, surveillance-resistant manner, everything that we love about crypto. Um, there's no chain out there that works in this way. If you try to do this on Ethereum, you're going to have to download, I think, 8 gigs worth of headers. No one's doing that. Everyone's using uh, full nodes that are trusted in the back end. Uh, and so with Cello, we built a consensus protocol. It's a proof-of-stake consensus protocol that has uh, a ZK-SNARK-based uh, like client that allows you to sync with the chain near instantly in a fully P2P, fully decentralized manner. And so that's the first thing that I think Cello does that's pretty unique. Uh, the second thing is about usability, right? I think uh, billions of users, public key derived addresses, they're probably too intimidating for that number of users. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, every time you copy paste one of these things, you know, your heart kind of skips a beat, especially if you're making a bigger transaction. Everyone's always doing test transfers. It's, it's just really, really intimidating, even for us, right? So how is this going to work for everyone? We need better identifiers. And so I think ENS and, and these kind of things are interesting, uh, but unless you, you know, actually put your name on there and kind of give up even more privacy, um, then I think we need something better. And so we really believe in phone numbers as identifiers. And so Celo has a decentralized phone verification protocol uh, that allows you to effectively, in an encrypted manner, map your phone number to your wallet address, which allows you to then subsequently receive payments to your phone number. And that's really great from a usability perspective because people have each other's phone numbers in their mobile devices and contact lists. And so you have this incredibly big social network that we can bootstrap off of that you know, WhatsApp and, and others have really tapped into very effectively uh, that allow you to transact just really, really easily. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, tangential to this, if you're sending tokens around on many platforms today, you have to pay for those transaction fees with, a, um, with another currency, right? On Ethereum, if you send USDC, you have to pay for that with um, ETH. Um, that's, again, fine for you and I, but for, for the next billion users, it's probably going to be too intimidating. And so on Celo, you can pay for gas with tokens. Celo is fully EVM compatible, and so you can pay for gas with ERC-20 tokens. And that just makes it way, way more usable. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's all about mobile. It's all about usability. So uh, if your phone number is ported or your phone is stolen or you lose your phone, do you lose your bank too? No, so that's, I think, a, a really common and, and important question. Um, um, phone numbers get stolen all the time. It would be definitely 
um, risky to tie the funds themselves to your phone number. Uh, and so instead what we do is we allow you to optionally, and this is opt-in only, map your phone number to your wallet or uh, alternatively also to a public key uh, that you can use to securely communicate as well. And so uh, your funds are never actually secured by your phone number. Instead, um, your phone number kind of works as a pointer that points to, to your wallet. Um, and so even if someone steals your phone, unless they actually steal your private key, they do not have access to your funds. And that's obviously really important. What do you think uh, is realistically holding us back from going from 5 million MetaMask accounts to a billion users? Is it all about the gas fees? That certainly prices you know, a number of use cases and users out. But um, what are some of the building blocks uh, that you all have focused on and, and that you think are, are you know, generally necessary to you know, 100, 200x the growth of, uh, of crypto worldwide? Yeah, so I mean, gas fees certainly are, are a huge factor. Um, and you know, we're seeing a proliferation of chains and I think that's uh, certainly helping address the issue. We're also seeing a lot of great innovation around scalability and sharding and, and a whole slew of other things. I think all of these things together will, will certainly help. Um, at Celo, you know, it's not lost on us that to service billions of people, you need a very, very, very scalable uh, chain. Uh, and you know, we've already been investing heavily in that. Uh, but we also yesterday announced something pretty exciting. Um, yesterday, uh, Mistin Labs, which is a new company formed by some really premier uh, researchers from um, kind of distributed systems researchers, cryptography researchers, programming languages researchers, um, who previously worked on the DM blockchain. Um, they just started a company uh, and they just went into a kind of strategic partnership uh, with the Cello Foundation to kind of join the Cello community. Uh, and they're going to be working, um, applying uh, and doing new research uh, on exactly this problem. Um, and so they've, in the past, done some really uh, great things around kind of disentangling consensus from transaction ordering. Um, if you think about it, maybe this is a little too technical, but uh, in a traditional blockchain, you have to first broadcast and gossip everyone's transactions to everyone, and then you have to do the same with blocks that get uh, finalized, either through mining or through uh, proof of stake consensus. Uh, that means that your transactions effectively have to be communicated amongst every node twice. Uh, and that's a, a real, um, kind of scalability bottleneck. It's something that is needless. And so they've done some really interesting research uh, creating these DAG-based mempools uh, that effectively eliminate this using a protocol called Narwhal, named after kind of the, the dolphin with the tusk. Um, and so it's a, it's a really interesting idea. Uh, and they've paired it with kind of a new consensus engine called Tusk. And, um, and they're going to be applying this kind of work to the Celo blockchain. And so, um, you know, we're, we're committed to make Celo kind of the fastest EVM compatible chain out there. Um, and, uh, and they're, you know, working really hard to, um, as of kind of yesterday, uh, to, to make that happen. Yeah, I think a lot of the scalability uh, challenge is still social scalability. So you want to talk a little about uh, DeFi for the people? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and this is something that, that now, I think, this summer we've, we've seen a little bit of a um, you know, again, we're really focused on, on mobile, really focused on, on bringing financial infrastructure, bringing DeFi to, to as many people as possible on mobile phones uh, globally. Um, and uh, to do that, you know, certainly we need usability, we need wallets, we need, um, you know, great DeFi products that, that are thinking with a mobile-first mindset. Uh, but you also need liquidity, right? I think if you want to be able to to trade with low slippage, if you want to have more options for what you can borrow and lend, um, you, you need liquidity. And so uh, DeFi for the people is, is a $100 million um, program uh, really focused on this kind of mobile first DeFi use case uh, that's bringing liquidity uh, into the seller ecosystem and, um, uh, and effectively creating more utility uh, in DeFi on Celo so that people can access it on mobile devices. What are some of the goals uh, in the next six, 12 months with that particular initiative? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it really is to, to build a, a very robust and um, um, 
kind of healthy mobile DeFi ecosystem on Celo. Uh, already, I think I checked today, Celo's ranked um, top 10 on DeFi Llama in terms of TLV, uh, sorry, TVL on, um, uh, on the chain. Uh, there's just under a billion dollars worth of TVL uh, currently on the platform, and so that's already really great. That's, um, you know, it's only about a month into the program. Um, and this is without um, kind of Sushi launching its incentives, without Curve launching its incentives, and, and without um, Aave launching its incentives. And so all those things are coming. It's going to be really exciting. Um, and, you know, the, I don't think we have kind of a certain uh, TVL number that we're, we're targeting. You know, I think, you know, certainly we, we know the liquidity is important, but we also really care about those mobile experiences. We really want people to be building really, really great mobile DeFi experiences. You know, I think Web2 has kind of figured this out 10 years ago. You know, there was this kind of big push. I think there was this uh, Googler called Luke uh, Vrubelski that uh, really advocated for this. He really wanted everyone in the Web2 world to think about building, um, you know, mobile, sorry, web applications and mobile applications um, before even thinking about the desktop variants of a particular product. Um, and Somewhat counterintuitively, if you do this, you can actually build a better desktop product in the end. It really helps you focus on what's important. Uh, it really helps you um, build with low bandwidth, with kind of all of the constraints that, that uh, mobile devices have. Uh, and when you scale that up to a desktop experience, you end up getting to a better, better experience. And so we really want DeFi products on Celo kind of doing the same. Uh, already Mula, which is a lending marketplace on Celo, they, they launched a, a mobile uh, experience first. And I think last week they, they finally launched the desktop experience. And so I think this is really the way that, that the whole Web3 community should start thinking. Um, you know, Web2 has figured this out 10 years ago, and it's a little ironic that kind of Web3, which should be really leading the Web2 world, uh, is kind of behind in, in this way. I think we, we really, really need to start building um, dApps in, in a fully mobile-first manner. You called out the MetaMask 5 million user number, so maybe I'll be more specific. What's the target, and what do you think within the next 6 to 12 months some of these new initiatives will help unlock for Celo? Yeah. Um, so I think on Celo, there's about 1.2 uh, million uh, active addresses. Um, obviously, it's hard to kind of estimate how many, how many users that is. Um, but, you know, certainly um, it's just a, a, a drop in the bucket for, for where we need to go. I think Valora, which is kind of the um, de facto mobile wallet uh, on the platform, has um, around 250,000 um, um, wallets that are funded. Um, and so, you know, our goal is really to, to grow these numbers to, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of, of, of users. Um, and, you know, that might seem relatively far-fetched, but, you know, Valora only launched earlier this year, um, and, you know, the growth has been just staggering. And when you, when you build for devices that are ubiquitous, and when you tap into kind of these social networks that exist with people's contact lists on, on people's phones, you know, that, that kind of growth is, is actually feasible. We've got a few minutes left here. I know I uh, want to talk about optics. Can you explain optics and, and why it's important for the future of the project? Yeah, um, it's no question we're in a multi-chain uh, world. Um, now there's uh, countless EVM-compatible chains and, and non-EVM chains out there that I think people are getting more and more excited about. Uh, multi-chain is definitely the future, and we're seeing dApps building across all of these different uh, chains and, and uh, reaching more users uh, through doing so. But you know that creates a lot of complexity. You know I think. Uh, certainly, it creates uh, uh, challenges on, on programmability, on user experiences, and a whole slew of different things. And so you, you're going to need really great primitives that allow you to communicate across these different chains. And you know, I think the Cosmos is credit. They have IBC. I think it's really uh, compelling and, and interesting. Um, but we don't really have anything like IBC uh, in the kind of non-Cosmos world. And so Optics really aims to be kind of the IBC of the EVM compatible world and, and possibly beyond. Uh, and it, it does so through a pretty interesting uh, trust minimized uh, incentivized uh, protocol that 
uh, doesn't require you to verify block headers in other people's chains, but is significantly more uh, trust minimized than something like a multi-sig based uh, bridge. And it has a really elegant, I would say, programming API. You can build these things called zaps on top of optics. Um, and it allows you to you know, not just send tokens over these uh, communication channels, but also arbitrary messages. And so if you're bu building a DAP and you're deploying it on, I don't know, 10 different chains, uh, but you want to do governance on a single chain, you're going to probably want uh, an easy way to communicate those governance decisions to all of the different chains. Um, and so Optics is, is uh, aiming to be a really good way of doing that. Uh, we just launched it. It's, it's on Polygon, Ethereum, and Seller right now. Uh, already um, pulled together is, is, has started working on, on using it for their governance uh, communications for, for their Celo and Polygon and Ethereum instances. Uh, I think increasingly it's going to be a, a really great option as we kind of roll it out to, to all EVM compatible chains uh, to send messages. And so, yeah, definitely check it out. It's the brainchild of James Presswich, uh, Mr. Best Hair in Ethereum. Um, it's, again, it's a really, really great design, uh, and I highly recommend you check it out. Just uh, from a, a bandwidth perspective, you are going to have some concentration of developer activity, of user activity around some core blockchains. Over time, how much concentration do you think there will be? Is it going to be five to ten different blockchains that are, uh, make slightly different design decisions? You're mobile first. Uh, Solana is more geared towards traders. You mentioned IBC and, and the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, interoperability and building bridges between them, I think, is important. But realistically, how many bridges need to be built? And how concentrated is that ecosystem of layer one chains and, and layer two chains going to be, in your opinion? Yeah. It's a fascinating question. And I think one that um, you know a lot of people have different opinions on. I think there's kind of folks who are in the camp that composability is king and, and synchronous communication is, is going to uh, be just what people want because it's you know, arguably a little easier for, for programmability. Um, and then you, know, you have um, the folks arguing that tools will get better. Um, you're going to have one chain for each application eventually. And everything will be asynchronous amongst them, similar to kind of the web um, kind of 2.0 world that, that uh, people have to develop against uh, today. I think I'm definitely leaning more on the, on the you know, multi-chain world. Um, I think already this year, we're seeing just so much excitement in so many more chains. And I think people probably were assuming would be, would be big this year, uh, last year. Um, and, and I think that will, um, that will continue. Um, but I think you do need uh, to make things compatible from a programmability perspective, right? I think uh, Solidity, you know, really is, you know, possibly the JavaScript of the future. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting innovation happening in programming languages, and, and I'm very excited for them. But I think you still ultimately have to support Solidity uh, because I think that's what the developers are, are, are primarily using today. Lightning round question with one minute left. Uh, let's try to make this a little bit more tangible for everybody. What's your favorite application that's been built so far on Celo that, that might be unique uh, to Celo based on your design considerations? Great question. Um, so we have all the usual lending markets and um, uh, decentralized exchanges and everything that you'd expect. Um, but there is this one application, one dApp called Impact Market. Um, which is they basically fundraise multi millions of dollars and and they're now dispersing those funds in 50 cent a day increments to tens of thousands of people around the world. Um, it's really exciting. They have a heat map on their website. If you go to impactmarket.com, you can see where all the activity is. Uh, a lot of you know places like Brazil, Venezuela, Nigeria, Ghana, um, 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 just throughout the, the entire world. Um, and what we're seeing now is that people take those funds and they start um, really transacting, using them as a form of um, electronic payments uh, in, in all of these different markets. Uh, and you see you know, people buying groceries, people um, um, using it like you know, we use Venmo or Cash App here in the US today. Um, and so that's just really, really exciting for me to see. That's totally unique. Uh, and something that you haven't seen before elsewhere. It's, it's also, they've also been able to do so 
uh, with kind of orders of magnitude less overhead than something like Give Directly, which was kind of you know frequently cited as the leader in kind of the cash transfer space. Um, and you know it's thanks to crypto that they're able to cut costs so much and operate globally, uh, and and just with so much efficiency. And so it's just really heartwarming to see. More of those for sure uh, yeah. as we get to the next billion. Well, Mark, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and, and for a good conversation. Um, we're going to keep moving right along. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me.